the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. This quote was made by the founder of Salvation Army, William Booth. My question to you this day is, what is the measure of your surrender and how great is your power? We will continue on our journey through the Crossroads series that we've been exploring the profound significance of the cross in our lives. Today, we're going to focus on Hebrews 12, verses 2 through 4, where we see Jesus' willingness to endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him. Jesus knew that by fulfilling the Father's will and becoming the firstborn among many brothers and sisters was the plan, and he did not stray from it. This same principle of surrender and obedience applies to us as we navigate our own crossroads in life. Our surrender and obedience to Christ empowers us to become those who testify of God's freedom and fullness in our lives, always leading us to hope. I'm sorry, I'm getting used to this. I feel like I have a bit and bridle on. This is my first time wearing it. So let's start with the main scripture today, Hebrews 12. We look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention and expectation onto Jesus, who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, I'm going to repeat that. Because his joy was focused, his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and conquered the humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who opposed their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. After all, you have not yet reached the point of sweating blood in your opposition to sin. This was read out of the Passion Translation. So what is our first takeaway from that statement? When we look into the face of Jesus, we look away from the natural realm. Yeah, give me a hand here. I feel like I'm going to eat it or... That won't work. Okay. He did it. Let me repeat that. When we look into the face of Jesus, we look away from the natural realm. What are you shaking your head for? I know, it keeps flopping. I don't know what to do. I'll take the handheld. I know, but it's very, um, it's, it's taking my attention away. <laughs> it's distracting. Thank you. Okay. Jesus in us causes faith to be birthed within us and leads us forward into faith's perfection. Every time we look at the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we look away from Jesus. Looking away from Jesus means that we also look away from the faith that has been birthed in us. Looking away from Jesus means that we look backwards at the situation not looking 
and moving forward. Looking away from Jesus leads us away from faith being birthed in us and leads us to the land of doubt and confusion. I speak the truth to you this morning. I pray you have ears to hear. Jesus, open the eyes of our heart this morning that we might see you, that we might be moved by you, that we can hear your word, and it falls on good soil this morning. Let me remind you that the scripture tells us in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith brings our hope into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. Another translation says that it is the assurance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Genesis 19 is an interesting story about the city of Sodom and Lot and his family who lived there. I'm not going to go through the entire chapter with you. You can read that on your own. Genesis, in case you didn't know, is the first book of the Bible. It's easy to find. And you go to chapter 19 and you can read about this. So God tells Lot to take his family and head for the mountains. Why does he do that? Because of the wickedness that was taking place in Sodom. Lot was a righteous man. God wanted to spare his life. So he tells him to head for the hills. Lot tells God, they're too far for me to get there. Could you maybe allow the city that's just around the corner to be spared and I could get there? God tells him yes. Now I am paraphrasing this in modern English terms. You will not find this in the King James. God tells him yes, but hurry up and get there because I can't do a thing until you get there. But he tells him this. Don't look back and don't stop for anything in the in-between on the journey because of the coming judgment. Lot convinces him that it's too far, and so he goes. Lot and his family arrive at the town that God agrees to spare, and the unleashing of God's judgment starts on the former town Sodom. Lot's wife and family are safe in that town that God spared. God had provided for them. What does Lot's wife do? She looks back. Isn't it interesting that she's referred to as Lot's wife, but not a name? I don't know, just a little side note there. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Surrender means this. I cease to give resistance to an enemy or opponent, and I submit to their authority. Your flesh is at odds with God. It's an enemy. That's what the scripture says. It wants to do its own thing when it wants to do it and how it wants to do it. How's that working out for you? Let me show you some pictures of surrender that are currently shown within our culture when you look for graphics. That's the first one. You like it? He's like, dress, wait a minute, don't go too fast, go back. There you go. I just found it interesting. He's in a corporate suit, you know, sitting on a chair, kind of looking all casual, but he's got his white flag up. Then the next one is, I give up. That's usually how we hear about surrender. But this is what God wants when he says surrender.
Until you surrender to the lordship of Christ, you will continue to resist his authority. Lot's wife had been given provision by the Most High, yet she was not surrendered to his authority. Faith is always moving us forward into God's purposes, plans, and promises. It doesn't take us backwards. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we look away from the natural realm and embrace faith's perfection. Amen? I want to share with you a little story about water skiing. When I met Randy, I was in high school, and he lived across from a lake, and he lived most of his hours at play on the water. And he was a tremendous water skier. And I remember riding in the boat and watching him and saying, that's so cool. I want to learn how to do that. I lived in the city. I didn't know how to do that. So he ended up taking me out one day. And as you would expect from Apostle Randy, there was all of these, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And so he was giving instruction. And so I got into the water, and I had to remember that I had to put my skis on because they were throwing them at me from the boat. So first I had to catch those, and then I had to find the rope that was starting to float down. And then I had to make sure that I put the rope between the skis, and the ski tips were up. And then I had to remember to tell the boat to go forward. And I'm thrashing in the water because I'm not used to having these sticks on my legs and not used to trying to keep a rope there. And I was just fighting it so hard. And I remember him calling out from the boat, and he just said, just lean back and relax. And so I leaned back, and I relaxed, and the thrashing stopped. And then I was able to tell the boat to go forward. And I popped up out of the water after a couple of times. First time looked like a yard sale. Stuff was all over the place, but he skied on one ski. I had to ski on two. Why do I share that story? Because it's about how we thrash in life when we don't surrender. We sometimes take all of these things that we should be doing and how we should be doing them and why isn't it working, and we forget to lean back. There's a song, and it's called Lean Back. I'm going to lean back into the loving arms of my Father. I'm going to breathe deep and know that he is good. He's a love like no other. See, when we're surrendered, we can lean back. We can lean back into the fact that he's there. We can trust him. We can trust what he's doing, even though we don't understand it. We don't have to thrash. We don't have to try to control the outcome of it. But it is a surrender that is required. So surrendering is looking away from the natural realm. Those circumstances that have come to entangle you. Because you tend to worry. You tend to try to figure it out on your own. And you leave God out of the equation because you're not looking at him. Surrendering is trust. I don't know how this happened. I don't need to know the why. I just need to know these things. What am I to learn from this? What draws me closer to you? And what is going to continue to perfect my faith? Some of you want to know why, particularly you teacher types. I'm telling you, the why will not fix the answer for you. It will give you understanding, but that understanding may lead you away rather than cause you to draw close. James 4, 7 through 8 says this, 
Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify you, your hearts, you doubly minded. Submit. Surrender. Place yourself under. Obey. When we submit to God, gaze upon him and not the circumstance. We can resist the enemy. We can oppose him. We can stand against the enemy. And he will have to flee. See, I've heard it taught before, just resist the enemy and he'll flee. But here's the first part of it, submit to God. You can't have the fleeing part without the submitting part. Without his presence in our lives, we will continue to look at the circumstances and we will continue to be sinful in our unbelief and remained doubly minded. James says that a double minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When I think this, but maybe this, but maybe this, I'm not confident in what God said or what his word says. Avoid the trap of being Lot's wife. Don't be Lot's wife. Don't look back. We look back because it's what's familiar. It's what we understood, even though it was lacking and horrible in some ways. And it didn't get us forward in our, faith, our journey of faith. It actually stopped us at different points. We either have to get to the high place of God, the mountains, the ascended place, or we have to get to the place that he's secured for us, that he's made provision for. In looking at your circumstances, you may not be able to see with supernatural faith that you could already be in your land of provision. Some of you are trying to fix the problem, and sometimes the problem is your provision. You go, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. How, how can you say that? I'm not God. But I know that he's always got my benefit for me, not my calamity. I know that he's leading me to a place that is good. And I know that I can praise him in the land of the living. And so I can trust him in that place. Amen? Embracing surrender and obedience. We find true fulfillment and purpose when we surrender to God's authority and obey his leading, trusting in his wisdom and provision. Surrender births obedience as seen in Jesus' obedience to endure the cross for the joy that was set before him. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. The pleasure of fulfilling the Father's will and becoming the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Obedience is this. He was so focused on the joy that was set before him, knowing that you would be his, he was obedient to fulfill his mission, to endure the cross, and conquer the humiliation. Obedience is not merely being compliant with God's commands, but it stems from a surrendered heart. So you can be compliant with God's commands. You can be standing up, but sitting down on the inside. I've done that before. I was one of those strong-willed child types where my father would say, you need to do this. And I would say, sure. And I would do it, but on the inside, my heart was not a heart of obedience. Come on, church, it's time to check ourselves. It's time for us to understand that we have allowed ourselves to slip and be out of sync with what God is asking us in this hour. He is trying to awaken the church. 
But I'm telling you, the church has been intoxicated. And it's hard to wake up a drunk. You got to become sober. That's what the word says. Be sober and be alert. It says that in 1 Peter. For your, your enemy, the adversary, roars like a prowling lion. Can we tell what is coming upon us if we are not surrendered? You all are looking away from me like, mm. it's like when the teacher asks a question and everybody goes, I believe that you've been formed in God's image. I believe that you function with the mind of Christ. I believe that you do not function out of a spirit of fear, but that of love and power and a sound mind. I believe that you have been made surrendered soldiers of God who are obedient to his command. I believe that you are alert, that you're sober, that you're understanding what is coming upon the earth and what your purpose and plan is in that. I believe that. The question is this morning is, do you? It's not about showing up to church on a Sunday morning and hearing a message that's going to tickle us and then send us home to live like hell the rest of the week. I want to live like heaven 24-7. Jesus said that my will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. It's possible to live the will of God here on earth heavenly. But we've got to align with heaven's principles. And that is a surrendered heart, and that is an obedient heart. The cross was not the hard part of Jesus' mission, nor was the enduring of the intense pain of it. The hard part was remaining steadfast in his obedience, not wavering in the moving forward. His obedience was birthed out of his surrender. We find true fulfillment and purpose when we surrender to God's authority and obey his leading, trusting in his wisdom and provision. You know, we all have lots of opportunities to question God. Why this? Why that? How come? Why didn't this happen? Why is it taking so long? But the bottom line is, is at the end of the day, can you surrender to him? If you don't have your why answered, if you don't have your question answered, if it takes 25 years rather than 25 minutes, can we stand and can we stand firm in our commitment and our covenant with him? He has certainly stood firm in his commitment, and covenant to us. And so can we stand firm in this hour? Can we stand firm in surrender and obedience in this hour? Here's a picture of surrender and obedience for you. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see in Matthew 26, our Lord going into the garden And Gethsemane means oil press. He's being pressed, pressed. And he wants to go there to pray. And he asks the trio, Peter, James, and John, to accompany him and to stay awake and pray with him. In verse 38, he says this, My heart is overwhelmed and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Stay here and keep watch with me. As he walks away just a short distance, he conti- excuse me, he continues in verse 39. My father, if there's anything you can deliver me from this suffering, please take it from me. Yet what I want is not important, for I only desire to fulfill your plan for me. That an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. I was talking with somebody who's in the healthcare field, and I was asking them about Jesus sweating blood. 
and they made the comment that that would be a physiological response to a body under tremendous stress. See, I don't believe that Jesus was asking them to pray in order for him to endure the cross. I believe, based upon some commentary that I've read recently, that he was asking them to agree with him that he would not prematurely die so that he could fulfill the mission that God had for him to endure the cross. We've been taught that he was crying out, please take me away from this. This is bad. This is bad. I think he was saying, don't let me die before I can fulfill this. Because he knew what was at stake. You were at stake. You and you and you and your families and those that you know, you were all at stake. And he did not want to pass before he could fulfill that mission. Just as Jesus looked beyond the cross to the joy of redemption, we too must fix our gaze on him and the joy even in life's challenges. I know a little bit about this. I know a little bit about having your heart broken and decimated so badly that you're not even sure that you can go on. That the questions of why were ringing and attempting to paralyze my heart. When our son passed, there was no reason. There was no plan. There was no foremention or way to prepare ourselves. But just like you, we had to surrender. We had to say, God, we don't understand why, and we really don't even need to know why, because it's not going to change the outcome. See, your why and the answer to it won't change the outcome a lot of times. You may feel satisfied in knowing it, but then you have another thing you got to deal with. But the fact of the matter is, is if we will surrender our hearts in true worship, just like Apostle Randy was speaking this morning. This isn't a game. This isn't a tradition. This isn't something that you do for a couple hours on a Sunday and then feel better about yourself. This is life. This is life in the kingdom. God wants you to live it to its fullness. He wants you to experience the freedom of the purchase that he made for you at that cross. He doesn't want you dragging around your old baggage anymore. He doesn't want you dragging around your victimization and all the offenses and all the unforgiveness and all the crap that happened to you. He doesn't want you dragging that around. He wants you to put it at the foot of the cross. Why? Because it's his. He paid for it. It's no longer yours. When I surrendered to Christ and I submitted to his lordship, the reality is that I no longer lived. Galatians 2.20 says this, I've been crucified with Christ. And it is, it, I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Counter to what you've heard or what you've experienced in life, when you surrender to God, you die. You die. I want to be dead. I don't want that old bee anymore. She don't look too pretty. She wasn't too surrendered. And she sure wasn't obedient. 
Surrender means ceasing resistance to God's authority, moving us forward in his plans and promises. Your old nature, the way that you used to think and speak and do things, is no longer effective when you die. You no longer live independent from him. You are interdependent. You are partnering with the God of this universe, and he is looking to use your yes to bring redemption through his love and sacrifice to a hopeless and a confused world. See, I I feel like the culture is really confused about the church right now because they don't see a whole lot of difference. They, They don't see a surrendered, laid down lover in the church. They don't see somebody who is living a life who is choosing to live in purity and holiness because of God's glory that surrounds their life. They see a person who professes to know Christ, but doesn't really live as if they're living, if Christ is living through them. I don't say that to be condemning. This message was out of my time with the Lord, and it is out of my time of repentance. It was out of my time of recognizing how I was falling short in my relationship with Christ. But I wanted to bring this to you because it comes out of a heartfelt concern for this community of believers because I see you in such a way that I'm not sure you see yourselves. You know, we went to National Day of Prayer on Thursday, and our mayor stood and read the scriptures and professed his relationship with Christ. Our former mayor, also a believer, ended up sharing how Jenny and I used to covertly meet with him and pray over him. That was something that we held in confidentiality for him. As they professed their relationship and their surrender and their obedience in Christ, the atmosphere shifted in that place. God's presence and anointing was felt by all. See, we can't complain about our state and national leaders Call them all kinds of names and not pray for them. Because the same thing, being a psychology major, that we complain about is oftentimes resonant in us. The thing that we can point out is often how we live our lives. This is a turnaround Sunday. Surrender is trust. It's acknowledging God's provision and his role in our circumstances. When you live out of a surrendered life, living in obedience to him, you live a resurrected life. You are full of purpose, power, and authority. You want to see things shift? Surrender. You want to see things shift? Be obedient. Quit making excuses. Your excuses don't pleasure God. When you are surrendered to Christ, you no longer question or bargain with him. How many of you have bargained with God before? Please, please, please don't make that happen. You don't bargain with him anymore. You submit to his authority and you become obedient. I remember when I took a parenting class and my kids were little and they talked about the fact that you don't allow bargaining to take place. I used to hate to take my kids to the grocery store because they had the candy section right at the checkout counter. Oh, I know. Now, I'm the one whining about it. But anyways, I would take them, and they would, oh, 
mom, if you do this, if you let me have this, I'll do this. And I thought, oh my goodness, is this what I do with God? Yeah, it's what we do with God. We tend to get really emotional when we consider the cross. We focus on the beatings and the pain and even the death that Jesus went through. Christ wants you to focus on his perspective. He would do anything in order to be with you forever. And he wants to experience no more separation in your relationship. His obedience was based on his joy, not what he was going through. As you continue to center your focus on your circumstances, you begin to vacillate in your obedience. You look for shortcuts. You look for a way out from under the pain and the trial rather than focusing on the joy. So as we fix our eyes on Jesus, let's embrace surrender and obedience in our journey of faith. Just as Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, may we surrender our will to God's and obediently follow his leading. So my big questions to you today are this. Are you living a surrendered life? Do you find it difficult to live in obedience to Christ, constantly bargaining with him to change outcomes rather than embracing that which has been presented, trusting he has your benefit in mind? Are you willing to live for him so that he might live through you? I'm going to ask you today, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, if you've never said yes to his lordship, then today can be your day. He's looking for hearts that are willing to surrender. And if you've found yourself in a place where you haven't surrendered your will, you've surrendered your, your heart, but you haven't surrendered your will, God wants to do a work on that to you this morning. You can, you can proclaim Christ as Lord. You can hear from his Holy Spirit, but still not live in the fullness and perfection of life, which is your portion as you surrender to him. It's not easy, but with God's help, we can do this. And your resurrected life, surrendered and obedient, may be the only Bible that someone is ever introduced to in their life. Why wait a minute longer? So if you fall into one of those categories where you've never given your heart to Jesus, surrendered your life to him, I want to give you the opportunity to do that this morning. And if you have given your heart to Jesus, but you feel like you've allowed your will to creep back in, that has affected your ability to surrender, your ability to be obedient, then this morning is your morning also. So I'm going to ask us all to stand. Would there be anyone who would raise their hand this morning and say, I want Jesus. I want Jesus in my life. I want him in a way that I've never experienced him before. I want to see him not only be the Lord of my life, but I want to surrender to him. I want to see my life be transformed as a result of me no longer living and him living through me. Let's, let's pray this together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I invite you to be Lord of my life. I surrender, and in surrendering, I die, and you live through me. I thank you that I no longer have to struggle against you but I can lean back into loving arms of my father this morning. 
I proclaim you as Lord of my life. And I proclaim you as the one who has made a way for me. I surrender all. And I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he made a way for me where there was no way. Now let me just pray of you. God, I pray for the transformation of these lives, even starting today, this moment, in Jesus' name. I pray for resurrection life to be flowing through these individuals this morning. I pray, Father, that they would be transformed, that if there has been things in their life that they have been consumed with, that they would no longer have an appetite for those in the name of Jesus, and that they would be hungry and thirsty for you, O oh God. Father, I pray for a transformed company of believers in this place, in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that you don't leave us the same as when we came in, that we go out different. As we enter that parking lot, we're entering the mission field that you've called us to. And God, we repent of those things that we've whined about, that we bargained about, that we've complained about, and we release them to you this morning. And we say we know that you are the arms of love, that we can breathe deep and know that you are good this morning. Father, I pray for a healing of hearts this morning. I, I just feel like... Um, it's a double word of knowledge that there are, there's someone here who um, their heart has been broken, but they also are perhaps struggling with heart issues. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Okay. Well, we pray for Tom right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for a healing of his heart not only his physical heart, but his spiritual heart. We tear down any remainder of disappointment, of, re of rejection, of abandonment, and we release the sonship of Christ into his heart this morning. We thank you, God, that you love us so much, that you are our healer. And so I pray that over the entire congregation. If you've got something that you need healing for, just begin to speak it out to God right now. Say, God, I need you to heal. Go ahead. Speak it out. Don't be quiet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are our healer. We surrender to you. We surrender to your lordship. Expect to be different. Some of you are going, ah, I'm going to walk out of here and it's going to be the same old, same old. No, you're going to be different. Expect to be different. And those who are around you, when they start to hear some vocabulary out of your mouth that is not different, I pray for boldness to, to speak to that. You know, I've got people in my life when I begin to say, yeah, I'm not feeling good today. They'd say, wait a minute. God's healing is being manifest in your life. It just hasn't been manifest yet. So continue to walk in faith and assurance. Don't claim those illnesses and diseases. That's not who you are. You're not a victim. Your past experiences in life don't define who you are. Your life in Christ defines who you are. Let's start being bold about that. You know, the way that I know that I'm healed is I can talk about something that used to be a tremendous trauma, and it doesn't even bother me anymore. Doesn't even bother me. That's when you know you're healed. That's when God will use you to heal others. But this is the time, church, to be bold. We're not wimpy. We're bold in Christ. 
Carl and Julie, I, I just pray boldness over you as you go to your daughter's wedding, as you encounter people, as, as you see her enter into a covenant relationship. I believe God's going to give you opportunities to speak the word of God in faith. So I, speak, I just pray boldness over you in the name of Jesus. You think you're going for one thing, but you're going for something else. Come on, people. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. Let's be bold together. Let's get healed together. Let's die together. Let's surrender together. Let's find ourselves in a place of living a life in that much more abundantly because of Christ living through us and no longer resisting his authority. In Jesus' name, amen? All right.